Good afternoon and welcome back to another edition of The Lynn Lowdown. I'm Danny Vittori and today we have on a local author, poet, teacher, so many titles. <laughs> Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure and I like uh, very much seeing this place. Well, we're always glad to have you on. So could you do as quickly introduce yourself for us? Okay. My name's Elizabeth Gordon McKim and I'm a poet. I also am a performance artist, spoken word uh, performer, um, author, and I a uh, teacher, worked with kids for many years, and also people of all ages. I like, uh, I like the intergenerational uh, thrust of the arts and poetry. Mm -hmm. so. Oh, yeah. So I was looking at what you sent me, all the things you've accomplished, and I kind of went, I cannot fit this in a 10-minute interview, <laughs> so we're going for the highlights. But one thing is you're known as the jazz poet of Lynn, and I'm very curious where that came from. And I was named by two wonderful um, uh, artists from here, from here in Lynn. One is uh, Tony Toledo, who's a storyteller, and uh, he's now working over at Lynn Vogue, I do believe. And Don White, who's a singer, songwriter, storyteller, and author. And I moved to Lynn about 20 years ago. And the way I uh, met people was to join um, the, the arts community. That was my way of, um, of making friends. Because when I first moved here, I really didn't know anybody. And even now, uh, you know, when I'm an elder, I'm going to be 85 years old in September. I still love to uh, go to the, um, the venue, especially uh, the Walnut Street Cafe on Walnut Street, which is run by uh, Jim Chalmers, who's a Lynn native, and uh, his wife, Alicia Churchill. Uh, and uh, it's, um, it's, a, it's very important to practice your art. If you're an artist, you have to practice your art, whatever way you can. And so I like to go and share my poetry. Sometimes I have features. Sometimes I read in the open mic. And I guess we'll start with the one with that's all poetry. The mirror OK, I yes, I'd like to. Yeah. Um, yeah, that is called Lovers in the Free Fall, that, the name of that book. And I'm particularly fond of the book because um, it's got a mural that was torn down to, you know, build up a high rise over there in Central Square. And uh, so I think that um, I, I know here in Lynn, I'm, I'm the, the keeper now of this uh, wonderful mural, uh, which was done by an artist from the Dominican Republic. And uh, so that's really a collection of poetry. And it's just... You know, in the life of a poet, like each po each poetry book, in a way, presents a little bit of your concerns at this time in your life. So, and also, I am a poet that does um, songs and stories and poems. That's called the oral tradition of poetry, and those are my roots: is the songs, the stories, the poems, spoken and uh, written. I'm interested in this. Poetry is not my forte at all, but I yeah. find it fascinating for anyone who can do it. And you also mentioned that you've been in education as well. So you have a crossover of your poet, performer, and then you've also written a book for children, like how to write poetry. Yes, I have. Uh, I actually co-authored that with another uh, po Massachusetts poet, Judith Steinberg. And uh, she lived in, uh, in Brookline, Massachusetts. And I lived there for many years. And my, uh, my daughter went to school there and grandkids also. <laughs> so um, anyway, Judy and I met w when we were just really beginning to name ourselves as poets. And uh, we, we, we were so engaged and involved in uh, teaching uh, the teaching of children and teenagers and people of all ages. But mainly the book is for parents and teachers who want to write poetry with kids. And uh, I think it's a very um, 
appealing book because it's got a lot of um, wonderful uh, photographs. And the photographs were done by Ju Judy's uh, brother, Kerry Walensky, who was a um, National Geographic photographer. Oh, wow. Yeah, and also Karen Moss, who's been another friend for years. And she's a, a, a local painter. And um, she took a lot of uh, photographs um, through this book. So I think one of the appeals of the book is that it's graphically pleasing, and it's also got about 200 poems by children. Yeah. So, and I, over the years, honestly, I think I've learned as much from the words of children as I have from professional poets. And Because you were recognized in Switzerland, too. Yes. The European Graduate School for Expressive Arts. Exactly. So that was it. That's been a... a Really, a privilege and a pleasure over <clears throat> over 20 years um, to be in this little alpine village and to I don't have to give like uh, classes the way like academic classes on poetry, but I do a very informal. We call them uh, poetry at the red table, <laughs> and it, they're usually outdoors and they're for an, a, exactly an hour after lunch, and so and. Uh, and I do that, do about nine or ten in my times there of those workshops or more. And then I have students that confer with me and bring poems. And, uh, and I also have one night, which is my night for performing. Yeah. And that's another really important part of my, uh, my life as a poet, that is I love to perform. Perform really means like through the form. So I have had great, um, wonderful partners uh, in poetry performance. And at the European Graduate School, uh, the person who was the, the principal person for me was Paolo Canil, who is Swiss. And he was a very multi talented musician. He played everything from <laughs> antique hurdy gurdy and uh, flutes. He did a poem with me that had where he actually had two flutes and very crazy, beautiful uh, music. And uh, so Paolo, whom I met years before the European Graduate School, um, I met him at Tufts University here in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And I was in a summer program with early childhood education. <laughs> And all of those folks that taught with me that summer, which was, um, I don't know, it was maybe like 1970, 1969 or 70, they were all heading over to Leslie University. And they were starting this new program called uh, the Expressive Arts, Expressive Arts Therapy. And that was started by a guy here on the North Shore, Sean McNiff. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just was lucky. I was. I put myself out there. I was at in. I was at the right place at the right time, and I was good at what I did. I loved to teach. I loved doing this, and it was just an opportunity that I was very lucky, I think, to be there. Definitely a really extraordinary opportunity that you took full <laughs> I, advantage of. I definitely, did. that's what you have to do. That's what Shakespeare said to do. Take that when you know at the moment. If you don't take advantage of that moment, it's gone. So I was lucky. Yes, and I'll said before we have to wrap up. I will circle back to one of the books you gave. Is it just was released this year? The yes. one that's a collection of its drawings. It's your poetry. It's. Um, Edridge Knight, I yeah. hope I said that right. You did. Uh, his poems as well. So how did that come to be? Well, this was another, um, it came out of a, a relationship. Like I had a 10-year relationship with the poet Etheridge Knight, African-American poet. And I met him at a conference here in uh, Massachusetts. And also, it was all connected to this work with children because the first time that I uh, really met Etheridge, I met him in a book at the uh, Brookline <laughs> Public Library. That was the first time. And I thought, wow, what an interesting, lively poet. And I had heard stories about Etheridge because he was living in Worcester. And I knew that his most powerful poems at the time were poems that he had started in prison. And uh, so he was in... Um, you know, the big, the big top, as he called it, <laughs> um, in uh, Michigan City, 
uh, Indiana. And so anyway, my friend uh, who, who was teaching in the high school when I was teaching the kids in Little Rock said, well, if we're going to Little Rock, we should really stop in, uh, in Memphis and see Charlene and Etheridge. So I did, and that was the very first time that I heard Etheridge read a poem out loud. Now, he was a poet that, when he read a poem, I mean, you listened up, you know. He just had this very powerful voice, and he reached people, and he knew the importance of the out loud poem. Mm -hmm. And it didn't matter who you were or where you came from, you know, he made a connection with you if there was a connection to be made. And so when I first heard Etheridge read his poems, it was just amazing. I just, in a way, it changed me. And then I, you know, I met up with him later after he and Charlene had separated. And so then we had, you know, Etheridge had, um, you know, he had his own struggles, as we all do. And his struggle was with um, substance mm. abuse. And so there were times when I couldn't be with him. And some of the poems actually deal with my my feeling of, uh, you know, anger and the poems are, um, I, I think, tell a truthful story of our relationship, which was always very connected, but sometimes together and sometimes not together. And, uh, and it also is a compendium, this word, <laughs> which means yes. really, I said to you earlier, it means a bunch of stuff. But in this book, there's letters, there's little drawings made by both of us, photographs, like when Etheridge would take a photograph, of, when I took a photograph of, of him, generally he'd take my camera and take a picture yeah. of me. So I have an amazing uh, collection of poems and stories and everything from that time. So this book, in a way, was really deciding what to go in this book. And so that was it, and the order of it and all that. And I did start it. Like, Etheridge died 31 years ago, oh. so a long time ago. And I've had all this work. So it, for me, it's a, a great release, really. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they had a big day in Indianapolis. Um, so uh, I went there with my uh, beloved daughter and my beloved sister accompanied me. And uh, we so and the mayor of Indianapolis proclaimed Etheridge Night Day, which was um, I know it was pretty amazing. That's incredible, yeah. And uh, and there was a picture of him, a mural on the um, on the on the long side of this jazz club called the Chatterbox, <laughs> and so it was just amazing uh, to see that. And then the night before, I had my own reading uh, at this Indiana Historical Society. So. It was all like, I can't even explain it, but it was, I'm still, it was two weeks ago, and I'm wow. still kind of in a, just a se sense of, um, so full. It was such a release, mm -hmm. you know, so I think yeah. what the lesson for me is that just keep on getting your work out. Even if you have to wait a long time, sometimes things need to ripen, you know, your understanding of it. Mm -hmm. And also the book not only um, has uh, the beginning of our relationship in a long essay, um, but it also has th his death, and that I was there. You know, he actually died in my arms. And so all of those, their journal entries, like diaries, very simple reading, I think, um, and uh, tell the story of that, of that time. Mm -hmm. So the beginnings and the endings. And the family, you know, very important. So it all sounds incredibly powerful. And thank you for having the courage, too, to release something like that that I is know. so personal. It that took a lot really... of it. It did take a little bit of courage, I'll have to tell you. You know, whether you wanted everybody. You know, it's a question yeah. of the personal uh, and the political and the um, uh, therapeutic, the healing, and all of those things come into play. And there were many nights when I would wake up and I'd say, no, and first of all, I was getting older, too. I can't do this. There's just so much, you know, so much going on. And luckily, I had a good editor, this guy, Norm Minnick, who was um, my daughter's age. And he just, like, he took all these papers that I sent him. I sent things by paper instead yeah. of computer. You know, he had to go through it all. And 
So it was a big job, but it was a, it was a labor of love. And when I read the book, the thing that am uh, um, amazed me the most was that I told a story. Oh, yeah. You know? Yes, definitely. And that's what you want to do in writing, is mm -hmm. you want the, that narrative thread. Yeah, you definitely did. You've told such a story through your poems and your work, and I want to thank you again for coming on to talk about it as we have to wrap up, but thank you again for sharing. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and I, you know, um, Seth Album has always been a, a good friend, and I feel like uh, Lynn has been so important to me. Lynn is another, you know, mm -hmm. very a rich source of inspiration for me. So thank you very much, and thank you for having me on. Oh, you're very welcome, always. And once again, my name is Danny Vittori. This has been The Lynn Lowdown, and we'll see you next week with more guests.